So welcome, everybody, and welcome. It's our 23rd event in the ICSV series of Zoom panel discussions. I remember when our funder asked us to start these, and I thought, I can't do it. I don't know Zoom. It's impossible. And now we've just gone really strong on these, and I don't think we'll ever change. If we um, do in-person events, they'll probably be hybrid, and that's probably what everyone's thinking. But anyway, this is our 23rd Zoom panel discussion discussing various issues of terrorism and violent extremism. And we're excited to once again have over 150 professionals signed up for today's event coming from all over the world, from the United States, from Europe, uh, including some from Ghana, Kosovo, uh, Malaysia, Tanzania, Israel, Maldives, Tajikistan, and Somalia, as well as many others. So it's fun to have this global community coming together to hear our speaker and to uh, take part in the discussion. We welcome you all. And I see many good friends today and colleagues among you. I know you came out for Magnus and that's great. Welcome. In our last event, we presented our own work on white supremacism, uh, looking at violent extremism um, in the military. How can we prevent and counter it? And that was with Todd Hamas from RAND, who has also done a really good piece of research. If you missed that event or any of the 22 previous events, you can watch any of them. Um, the recordings are posted on our ICSVE website, and we also always post uh, the chat log because uh, we open up the chat. We like a lively discussion, and uh, and we keep it as a record afterwards so everyone can be involved in that because it's often quite interesting what people uh, say to each other. Um, likewise, I always like to point out that you can view our 265 short counter narrative videos featuring ISIS and Al Shabaab insiders, as well as a growing library of 20 former white supremacists and far right members denouncing violent extremism on our ICSVE YouTube channel. We're posting links to all of these, and if you want to read our papers, you can go on our website, and they're under research papers and brief reports. Um, before we start, I just always like to lay out the ground rules because we do leave chat open and we let everybody talk as much as they like in chat. And then later we open it to a uh, discussion where you can actually talk. But um, we gather the questions to address to our speakers. And um, we have learned, unfortunately, since we do talk about things like Islamic extremism, white supremacism, and so on, that sometimes we've gotten inappropriate comments placed in chat. And so we ask that you don't insult anyone's religion, race, or ethnicity. And uh, we're warning you that if you do, we'll eject you from the Zoom conference immediately, no questions asked, and you won't be back to welcome back to future events. So please stay professional and polite in your comments. Uh, we are a global community, and that's a really cool thing. So we need to treasure our diversity of experience and points of view so we can learn from and enrich each other with mutual respect. Um, as I said, we will capture all the chat and the video recording. We hope to mail it out to you tonight. If you are um, if you registered for the event, you can share that with others. And um, it will be on our, on our website under the events page. Uh, let's see. I always like to thank our sponsors before we begin um, and to thank our larger ICSBE team today. Um, Molly Ellenberg, who's here, uh, TM Garrett, uh, Kate Strindeshire, and... Um, uh, Sheikh Ali. And um, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, past and present, the U.S. State Department, the European Union, UN Women, Facebook, uh, private donors, and the state of Qatar. And I always give a special uh, shout out to the state of Qatar because they provided the support for our Breaking the ISIS Brand Counter Narrative Project. And uh, with their support, we've been able to make 270 in-depth video interviews of ISIS defectors, returnees, and prisoners and 16 of Al-Shabaab, of which we've created 250 short video clips of these terrorist defectors or disillusioned returnees and prisoners denouncing ISIS or Al-Shabaab as un-Islamic, corrupt, and overly brutal. brutal. And these uh, videos are used in Facebook campaigns, which Molly runs all over the world in over 27 languages, and we they're used in interventions as well, uh, in face-to-face -face interactions and online. And we're doing the same thing. We just completed 50 white supremacist research interviews. And we've uh, started something called Escape Hate that TM Garrett is making the videos for. And uh, we're following our Breaking the ISIS brand um, 
mold for that and also working with Facebook on it. Our video clips are made by TM Garrett, Shaitali, and myself working together, and they are on our YouTube channel. Um, let's see. So we're also really grateful to Facebook. Um, oh, and I want to mention that um, we are trying to do these um, Zoom conferences every two weeks. Sometimes we don't stick to it because life gets in the way. But um, two weeks from now, we will be having uh, Steve Hassan. And uh, Steve um, is a cult expert, and he will speak about um, how people get recruited into cults, his bite model, and his model of undue influence. And I think it will be super interesting. We've had him on as a panelist, but he really didn't have enough time to speak about his own work. This time, he'll be able to speak about his own work in detail. So today, we are so proud to have Magnus uh, Randstorp. And uh, I was living in Europe uh, way back when, uh, at the time when uh, Georges Silva de Bento was bringing together what became the RAN, the Radicalization Awareness Network. And Magnus was, of course, one of those experts that was invited. Um, I wanted to be invited, but George always kept saying, uh, check your passport. Uh, you don't have an EU passport. And I was living and working in Brussels at the time, but that didn't make the cut. So I didn't get to be in Magnus's group. But Magnus has been researching counterterrorism and CV issues for almost 30 years. And he's going to speak on his research about both militant jihadists and the Nordic resistance movement. And um, uh, in this regard, I'd like to say that militant jihadism in Scandinavia is often overlooked. Although 300 people from Sweden traveled to ISIS and other militant jihadist groups operating in Iraq and Syria between 2012 and 2017. And we know that 80% of the of these Swedish of the Swedish travelers and Scandinavian travelers came from just four Swedish countries. And we know that social media played a meaningful role in the recruitment process and that local vulnerabilities and influences uh, also played a role. And we hope to hear about that today. Um, many of the Swedish foreign fighters that have returned to Sweden already have not been prosecuted, and that's because they traveled to Syria and Iraq prior to 2016, when Sweden had not yet criminalized travel for the purpose of becoming a foreign fighter. Uh, as a result of that, many Swedes, including politicians, are really opposed to repatriating those who remain in Syria. So I hope we can get into that as well. In our own research, we were able to talk to two men from Denmark, eight men from Sweden, one woman from Norway and two women from Sweden. And in those interviews, the things that really stand out to me is one case in particular where the already deceased Anwar al-Awlaki, basically speaking from the grave, uh, played a really important role. And we did hear that over and over again for Europeans, um, that he was talked into endless jihad and uh, the idea of suicide terrorism and going to Syria from Anwar al-Awlaki. And um, I also recall um, someone that was sent to the mosque. Uh, these were immigrant uh, men and women for the most part, but that they also had uh, uh, Scandinavian passports, so dual citizens, or having had left their home country. Um, and one of them was sent by his family to the mosque to try to straighten him out. And the mosque is unfortunately where he got radicalized. Uh, very sad story. But anyway, I don't want to uh, talk about our cases. I want to hear from Magnus about his. So um, we hope today's guest has uh, answers both from his research and his work to um, point to good um, policy um, uh, responses. But Magnus Ranstorp uh, developed the world-renowned Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, um, which was founded in the mid-1990s, and that was quite an accomplishment. Uh, Dr. Ranstorp was also the first author to seriously map out the Lebanese Hezbollah movement and its connection to international terrorism and its relationship with Iran and Syria. And before and after 9-11, he was a consultant for CNN on terrorism issues. He was also invited to testify in the 9-11 Commission in its first hearing in 2003. Uh, currently, Dr. Ranstorp is a research director at the Center for Asymmetric Threat Studies at the Swedish Defense University 
And he's also quality manager of the EU Radicalization Awareness Network, the group that I tried to join but couldn't because of my passport, uh, Center of Excellence. And I've now overcome that obstacle and I am a member. But uh, RAN uh, COE is a practitioner-led network of 3,000 practitioners working on CVE issues across the EU. Dr. Ranstorp has worked extensively on the issue of foreign terrorist fighters, and his most recent publication on Swedish foreign fighters is based on a data set of 267 foreign terrorist fighters. That's out of the 300 that left from Sweden. And this was data obtained from the Swedish Security Service. In 2017, he also co-authored the EU RAN manual on responding to returning foreign terrorist fighters and their families. So you can see he's been looking at this from many, many different angles. In 2018, he published an extensive report on Salafism and Salafi jihadism in Sweden. Dr. Ranstorp also led the Copenhagen Municipality Expert Group that developed the Anti-Radicalization Action Plan in 2015. He also advises Stockholm City on CVE and the Swedish National CVE Coordinator. So I consider it a great honor to have Magnus with us. And I'm turning over the floor to you now, Magnus. It's all yours. And uh, thank you for agreeing to join us. You have to turn your mic on. Here we, here we go. Now you can hear me. Yes, we can. And being, having done this such a long time, I'm not particularly good at technology. <laughs> but. <laughs> But here we go. Thank you so much for um, for that very kind introduction. You can see you can see the slide, right? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, and um, uh, thank you so much for that sort of kind introduction. It's it, you know it's it's um, wonderful to see uh, not only Anne. Uh, last time we saw each other was in the Swedish embassy, and uh, uh, and in Washington in November actually, and. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we are not envious uh, as to the problem of not only foreign fighters, but also the issue of violent extremism in the United States, which uh, has taken on uh, you know, a particular urgency. Um, um, I also, uh, uh, of course, uh, saw Anne, should be mentioned perhaps, in, in opposite sides uh, on a, on a uh, foreign terrorist fighter case where, where a Swedish woman had returned who had taken down her children to uh, to uh, the caliphate. Uh, uh, but we all agreed, and I, this was a wonderful thing, we all agreed on the basic, uh, because as, as, a, as an expert uh, testimony, you have to, you have to of course, uh, uh, be, tr be true to uh, the court uh, and to tell the truth. And uh, we had the same, uh, should we say, analysis mm -hmm. as to what were the conditions uh, if someone traveled down to the to the uh, uh, to, to Syria. Uh, I also have to say I'm 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 very impressed with ICSBE and uh, the output, uh, regular output that comes out. It's fantastic to see such uh, uh, wonderful first-hand interviews, uh, first-hand experience, and, and, and all the sort of data that is coming out. So, so a big accolade to all those that are working uh, with the center, uh, very impressive. Um, I will try to present uh, now the Swedish case, and I was a bit worried that there would perhaps be five people uh, interested in Sweden. Um, it, it, it is part of the north. Um, uh, I see also Tore uh, uh, Björgo, uh, who have who, who, who I've been working alongside for almost thirty years. Uh, he has worked as long as I have, and um, uh, all the great things that he's doing on on, on this issue. So. Tori, if I forget something, please fill in. But I'm going to give you sort of like a tour of what is extremism like in Sweden. And I would have to venture to say that we have one of the most solid uh, evidence-based data, not just from our research, but also from other Swedish researchers in relation to covering both the right-wing dimension, but also 
the um, the radical Islamist dimension uh, that, that 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 we're seeing. We have hard data. Perhaps some of the and we haven't done this, but I'll come to that. We have some of the most hard data from um, uh, from what the environments look like in of any other country in the European Union. Please feel free to challenge me on this, uh, but I will I will present uh, some some of that data. Um, uh, what I want to do is just to give you sort of a, in order to discuss, you know, what do we do in terms of prevention and countering violent extremism, um, uh, you also have to understand the sort of nature of the threat and the nature of the issues that, that, that come up. Uh, and of course, they are becoming much more uh, international. Uh, without going into who we are, because it was such a kind sort of introduction, uh, I, I um, uh, have recently we've merged into the Center for Societal Security at the Swedish Defense University. Uh, and as Anne said, um, I uh, was also, um, together with the founding of, um, of the Radicalization Awareness Network, um, and I've been with that network, I'm now the strategic advisor for that network um, uh, in, in relation to trying to create uh, some um, actionable knowledge uh, across practitioner, across policy, across research. These are some of the, the uh, publications that we've done. Of course, the Swedish Defense University looks wonderful. On the left-hand side, you'll, you'll see uh, some of the publications. Uh, I, I'm sure you don't read Swedish, but there are some, some uh, uh, English uh, executive summaries of the publications. The one in English, uh, which is interesting, which has the data set from the security service, is the Swedish foreign fighters report on Syria and Iraq, where we had almost the complete data uh, or from the security service, uh, aggregated data of who joined um, um, ISIS and, uh, and, and how long had they been in the country, what were the citizenship, how, how many men and women. And we also have a chapter in there um, about the international uh, situation um, uh, in comparison, uh, which you may be interested in. We also done a lot of work. Uh, and now I, I would have to say we, we, we are pretty sort of renowned in, um, in, in the Nordics in relation to um, the financing of violent extremism. Um, we, we dig deep, we dig hard. We um, also did reports on how do they fund, uh, fund themselves to go down to Syria and so on. So I, I published something in the CT Sentinel on the um, microfinancing of, uh, of going to, you know, if you're a Swedish foreign fighter, uh, what's the data, what's the methods that were used. And we did um, two big reports for our civil contingency agency, for our agency on countering violent extremism, uh, one on uh, Salafism and Salafi jihadism, and one on the uh, right wing or the, um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, radical nationalist uh, uh, dimension or the groups. I'll present some of that as well. I will be pretty telegraphic because I know I'd rather have discussion. Uh, so I will go through my slides pretty quickly. Uh, but I, I do want um, just so you can get a flavor of what does the situation look like here? And also what are some of the things that we are doing about this issue? Um, so so let, me, let me start uh, then first of all by, let's see if I can navigate here by far-right extremism, and by focusing in particularly on the Nordic resistance movement, um, we have um, uh, the Nordic resistance movement is a pan-Nordic um, uh, uh, white power, uh, racial um, uh, right-wing group that uh, has been in existence for, for, for some time. Um, and if we start to, to work on this issue, uh, in terms of terminology, the uh, Swedish Defense Research Agency have done excellent reports on this. 
defines radical nationalism as a nationalist ideology that invalidates the principle of the equal value of all human beings or infringes on the social contract that defines the moral legal boundaries for when, where, and how, by whom violence may be used. Uh, and it also includes the notion, and which is quite important, and I'll, I'll actually come to you, Tore, uh, Tore Biergo, uh, uh, for the, should we say, the conceptualization that, that is important in this space, uh, in, in that radical nationalists believe a territory that is considered to be, to, to belong to a particular ethnicity, race, culture, that needs to be defended against other ethnicities, races, or cultures through violent means. Um, if you haven't read uh, Lisa Kati at the Swedish Defense Research Agency, she's doing excellent work with her team on the issue of um, you know, the online sphere uh, and uh, both right-wing but also Islamist uh, groups. Here is Torres, uh, um, should we say, typology, conceptualization. And of course, we talk about the far right. Uh, and uh, here you have the division into radical right and the extreme right. And if you look at this sort of box to, towards the right, the racial nationalism, so that the white race is superior, the neo-Nazi movements, the white power movements, that there is a necessity for a racial revolution. That is the domain in which the, um, the, the Nordic resistance movement is, is, uh, uh, is within. Um, but you also have a sort of a broadening spectrum. And I think this is why Tore Björgos and, and Lars Eric Benson's uh, typology is so useful because it also talks about ethnic nationalism, cultural nationalism, and you see the sort of different dimensions here. Uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side with cultural nationalism, they are uh, very focused on <coughs> Islam, Islamism, et cetera, but they're nonviolent and they work within the sort of political spectrum. So if you were to operationalize this in the Swedish sense, is that the, you know, it's not, enough to talk about the neo-Nazis, the traditional white power movement, but you also have to talk about the other different groups. And, and, and here they are. <coughs> you have alternative for Sweden, which is like alternative for Deutschland, which are individuals who have defected from the Sweden Democrats, uh, who are too radical. Who, who are promoting this, the, the Free Sweden a movement, the Nordic alternative right, and you have, uh, lastly, the Nordic resistance movement. So that is the sort of spectrum we're operating within. Um, the important thing is that these sort of, um, this spectrum is bleeding into each other. And that's perhaps best sort of shown by the fact that these are the messages by the Nordic resistance movement on the left-hand side, and by the alt-right, the sort of the, the, the other organizations that you saw on the chart on, on, on the right-hand side. And you can see an alignment there um, that, you, you know, of course, the National Socialists are focusing very strongly on the racial biological dimension, the ideology. They're focusing a lot on anti-Semitism. They're focusing on, on masculinity. Uh, or what it is to be a man, uh, 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 and, and also they are pressing on in terms of the approaching collapse of society. When they talk about their enemies, their very strong enemy categories, they talk about the system, not uh, political parties. And of course, as you know from uh, Brenton Tarrant and other, uh, or other right-wing extremists, they're pressing on the great replacement. They are arguing for repatriation. They're arguing for white genocide. They're arguing also for violence. And if you look at the alt-right side, I guess the only thing that is sort of really different is, of course, they don't focus on race, but on ethnicity. They talk about ethnopluralism. They talk about anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism, yes, they do talk about it, but the, the focus is on, on, on Muslims and so on. So, you know, there are a lot of different you have a broadening of the ideological spectrum, which means that you have, you have also a, a broader reach, which means that this may be also sort of more problematic. 
this is just a an illustration of of, of some of that, um, perhaps sort of crude, in relation to what happened after 9-11, in relation to the to the sort of right-wing uh, groups. You have white power, you have radical nationalism, you have the old, towards the alt-right. Um, you don't have to read all the sort of things there, but you have the, the very, very small counter-jihad movement that, uh, that, you know, worked around Eurabia, uh, there were specific websites, but they weren't sort of very sort of significant. And of course, then you have Breivik, um, and 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 that of course uh, stopped uh, to some extent uh, the uh, legitimacy or the apparent legitimacy or the arguments that were advanced by the counter jihad movements about you know their conspiracy theory that was was um, was outlandish. But gradually also, and I think this is quite important to bear in mind, you have had parallel ideological movements like the identitarian movements that have, uh, you know, uh, uh, had roots in the United States, in, uh, in Europe, particularly France, uh, in terms of the intellectual center, in Russia, uh, etc. And so you, you've had this sort of great responses to 9-11 to but also in terms of articulating um, what they are against and and if you can see up there in the little cloud if you had two things you should take away from my right-wing dimension that i'm talking about here there are two things that you should remember number one where is the neo-nazis the national socialists the the nordic resistance movements heading well, they're trying to normalize national socialism by repackaging it and by trying to participate in the political system while at the same time keeping all options open. On the alt-right spectrum, where you have a lot of Swedes that are being influential, they are, as Christopher Dalny, who is a leading Nordic alt-right um, uh, member, he says, it is to try to make the unacceptable acceptable. Is trying to use memes, it's trying to use jokes, it's trying to shift boundaries, etc. But the in, in essence, the, many of the messages are the same. And of course, you can see that the great replacement, the conspiracy theory about the white genocide is a constant sort of thing. Um, I just want to say just a few words about, about, about this. I don't want to labor on this. Uh, but, you know, you have a very, very complicated dimension when it comes to the right-wing scene. It's not just about the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists, uh, uh, etc., but you, you're, you're facing an increasing complexity uh, in terms of uh, the different dimensions that are at work here. Uh, Tore has a great team in Norway, in Oslo, working on this issue. Um, I just want to mention some of the things uh, from the Hope Not Hate Report, State of Hate 2021, if you haven't read that, there are, there are five different things you should take away from that report. Um, there are increasing ideological roots into right-wing extremism. They're driven by personalities and peer-to-peer -peer online contact. They're, they encompass broader groups like alt-right, incels, conspiracy theorists, they are also thinking about far-right ideas and concepts that intertwine with the mainstream debate. And this is what's so difficult. How do you unpack legitimate debate about immigration, et cetera, from these different uh, dimensions? Um, they're also, the, of course, the far-right uh, activists uh, participate in the culture war and far-right uh, integrate into to social media strategies in, into attacks. You can see that on the right hand side with the Halle attack. Um, and, and of course, you also have sexual violence, misogyny that's becoming uh, an issue. And more, most importantly, massive amounts of conspiracy theories that are used as a tool to attack different sort of minorities, whether it's QAnon, 5G conspiracies, great replacement or accelerationists. And I'm not going to say too much about this because I know the audience is very well versed. Of course, uh, you have Philip Manhaus on the right hand side. You have uh, Brenton Tarrant on the left hand side. Uh, this whole sort of conspiracy theory about great replacement is a constant sort of denominator 
uh, in this issue. What do we know then about the uh, Swedish uh, right to far right wing environment? Uh, a couple of things to note. Uh, the boundaries, exactly what I've said, between the violence promoting right wing extremist milieus um, and the right wing uh, uh, sort of uh, extremist milieus are blurred. Um, the sympathizers are increasing, their organizational relevance, except for the Nordic resistance movement, is it, less relevant. Uh, and you're facing sort of almost the same things that are happening in, uh, in the uh, Salafi jihadi milieu, is that you, you have leaderless resistance, you have calls to action, um, and, and the role of the internet, of course, is becoming more important. What does it concretely look like? Well, this is what the Swedish Security Service uh, contributed to our report. Um, they wrote a chapter in our report about what does the environment look like. And in Sweden, um, you have really sort of three environments. You have the, uh, the radical Islamists that, that constitute about 2,000 individuals that are on the security service um, radar. You have uh, 507, between 507 and 700 individuals who are on the right wing spectrum uh, and, the, and about 300 uh, on the uh, left wing autonomous uh, spectrum. Um, this is the data that uh, the Swedish Security Service provided. You can see it's male dominated, 85% men. Um, uh, they are coming from uh, different regions. The most dominant region is Stockholm, uh, Gothenburg, and of course, uh, in the south of Sweden. Uh, you can see heavy pre prevalence of, of um, crimes um, that they uh, also have uh, committed. But perhaps the most interesting thing is that they also have, some of those individuals have received military, paramilitary training. Nine participated in the conflict in the G Ukraine. Um, and but also others have participated in in paramilitary training in Hungary and and in other states, um, which uh, which has been uh, problematic. Let me just give you a, just a brief sense. This is the Nordic Resistance Movement. It's called Nord or the website is nordfront.sc. Um, uh, but let me just sort of give you just a very condensed version because I, I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, the NMR was formed in 1997. It was called the Swedish Resistance Movement. They wanted to replace democracy um, uh, and, to, and to create an all Nordic Senate, almost like a sort of a, like a Swiss model. Um, they, the Swedes, uh, and particularly the person you can see on the, on the page there, Number one, Simon Limbay, he, he has a firm hold of the movement. Um, he sits at the apex of the movement. Um, and also the, you know, there are, there is a Nordic, there is a Norwegian chapter. There used to be a Finnish chapter until they outlawed them. There is a Danish chapter and there is an Icelandic chapter. So um, uh, they, the, the Swedish dimension is important in this. Um, they want to, of course, um, they, they feel that, that there's no need for political parties. Um, they also have um, quite extraordinary views about freedom of speech. Um, um, and, and, uh, and they want to have trials uh, in relation to, 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 to those who are hostile to, to, to sort of the idea of, of creating this racially pure uh, state. They deny the Holocaust. They, they are very extremely anti-Semitic, uh, and they want to also throw out non-whites through repatriation. Those that were born, I, I believe, in 1975 um, uh, or after, um, to to their to their home countries, um, and it's very very tightly organized um, um, uh, into into. Uh, uh, different sort of operational uh, committees, uh, operational geographical zones. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not a movement that does things without sanction. Um, and, and that's important to bear in mind in, in relation to that it is an extremely hierarchical organization. 
What happened in, 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 in 2014, sorry, in 2018, or even before, they decided to participate in the elections. They tried to sort of go in through the elections, the election, election process. They, in 2015, they registered themselves as a political party. They stood uh, with different candidates um, uh, and they ran elections in three local areas. They failed miserably. They only got 369 votes, um, which is very low in those areas. Uh, in the national elections, 2,100 votes. So you can see that, yes, there's a lot of publicity around this movement. They create a lot of problems. They are a problem for democracy, a serious problem for democracy. But in terms of their growth, uh, they are quite limited. What happened also is that they developed uh, social media channels. They are um, trying to internationalize their activity. They are particularly in the United States connected to the Patriot Front, uh, and they are regularly hosting you know, um, uh, talks with the Patriot Front, but also other uh, uh, like-minded organizations in, in Europe. Um, they've gone through different phases. Um, uh, by you know, small street fighting organization. They have worked on propaganda. They have worked on creating a website. They have worked on the parliamentary dimensions so on, uh, and maybe uh, uh, for the future they may they, they may be planning uh, activity that that at least what they have been threatening. I'm not so sure that they have the will or the capability or the le legitimacy to do that. But you know, they are important. They but this is the sort of level of reach. What do they want? Well, this is what they say they want. The Nordic resistance movement uh, have a five-year plan between 2019 and 2024. And then, as I said before, they want to normalize national socialism. In essence, they want to sort of make it accessible at the local level. If I were to sort of really summarize all the, 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 the sort of different points you can also see on the left-hand side on the picture, I'm not very popular with the Nordic resistance movement. Um, there were about 40 politicians, other opinion makers. We were traitors. It says on the sign there my name, but also I was a traitor to the, the Nordic resistance movement. Um, they, um, they are very focused on uh, trying to sort of paint themselves as victims, but also uh, that they are the spearhead. Now, in 2018, um, uh, oh, sorry, 2019, when they were running uh, for election, that did not sit well with some of the founding fathers. So they there was a breakaway group called Nordic Strength, and they stands for sort of a new generation, more violent, Etc. And I think the security services and others were pretty worried about this breakaway group. There were 44 members of the Nordic resistance movement that broke away, um, and including the founder, you can see, was standing in the front there in the top picture. Uh, but we haven't heard very much from them, and they're pretty sort of uh, they're pretty silent uh, in relation to any sort of activity. So, but they're still uh, an important issue. Now, the NMR, or the Nordic Resistance Movement, um, has, of course, had connections to the Russian Imperial Movement. And uh, you know that the United States State Department have designated the Russian Imperial Movement as, as a terrorist-sponsored entity. And the, the, what I didn't know before we were going into this research was the, the, the level of... of, of um, or the depth of co connections between um, the Nordic resistance movement and the, um, uh, should we say, uh, the, 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 there's a Russian dimension here, uh, which is important to understand. Um, and you can see that through the fact that um, uh, there were two members who targeted, um, who, who went to partisan the Russian imperial movements, military camps, the partisan uh, uh, movement, uh, and their camps in St. Petersburg, and 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 trained um, for paramilitary training 
And they then returned and they targeted uh, left-wing uh, offices as well as um, uh, the um, uh, I- immigrant asylum centers, two asylum centers, uh, uh, through by, by, by placing explosive devices. But it really showed then that uh, this sort of dimension between Russia and these right-wing movements is something that needs to be investigated because Russia, uh, or should we say the Nordic resistance movement, have a very strong social media presence um, in relation to uh, VK, uh, v Contact, uh, which is the Russian version of the fa- Facebook. When I say strong, I only mean that they have some of the leaders are on VK, but they um, uh, they have more followers uh, than you would expect uh, in relation to the cause. Of course, uh, Russian imperial movement have been in Sweden participating uh, in the Nordic days, which is when the Nordic resistance movement shows off. Um, and but the reason why I show this is that. Many European movements, you also have to, to, to weigh in the fact that there are states like Russia and others who are supporting them in relation to funding and in relation to, 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 to trying to provide um, access. And this is something that research has not really, I guess it's difficult, but it's, it's an important dimension in, in, in terms of how they are exploiting uh, this in terms of influence operations. I don't want to labor too much, but you, you can see that this relationship goes back all the way to 2012. Um, and of course, in relation to the whole sort of the Ukraine Crimea issue. Big issue for the uh, Swedish uh, politicians and governments is should one ha- how should one handle a group like Nordic resistance movements? In Finland, they have outlawed them. Uh, I guess in in Sweden, um, there is a big discussion whether they should be outlawed um, uh, as an organization, etc. But it is being currently discussed whether that's legally possible or whether it's desirable. On the right-hand side here, you can see the device that were placed by these uh, individuals who were training with with the partisan movement. The South Africa Jihadism movement, I'm going to go very, very quickly uh, through this. Uh, of course, there's a context. In Sweden, we had a suicide bomber, Taimur Abdul Wahab, who had been staying in Luton uh, for a long, long time. Um, we have been pretty, you know, spared from most of the violence. And in Stockholm in December, the 11th of December, 2010, we had this suicide bomber, and this is the picture from the security service of the device that he had on him. Um, and he he checked his device, and luckily um, it detonated when there was no bystanders. Uh, but the question was, you know, wh- what was this? Um, it, it could have been a disaster. Uh, we have had three of these sort of different uh, Swedish important um, terrorism dimension in relation to Salafi jihadism. Uh, one is in Denmark, and this was a really interesting case uh, with uh, Post Boston 2010. You had a team of four persons, one of which had spent time, you'll see uh, Munir Dari, had spent time in an Al-Qaeda training camp in Miram Shah in Waziristan, Pakistan. Um, he had actually um, you know, been there for, for a long time. Uh, this was a sort of a follow-on attack uh, uh, plan by uh, that was being planned by David Headley. For those of you in the US, you will know that David Headley uh, had links to the Pakistan, but also had been the person who did the reconnaissance for the Mumbai attack um, in, in 2008. Um, Swedish and Danish intelligence stopped all of this, uh, but it was, uh, you know, a, a close call. Uh, it happened four, three weeks after the previous attacks, this attack, uh, this attack occurred. So, um, and it really sort of pointed the 
finger at the, the fact that uh, maybe there are uh, cells that are operating, um, but, um, uh, you know, Denmark has been for a long time facing a serious security threat, but there was Swedes willing to travel down to, to target uh, Yulon's boss in 2010 as a direct follow-on to the David Headley effort to try to target the same paper. And David Headley here is, of course, uh, who I'm talking about, who you may or may not know, um, was responsible also for the uh, for for reconnaissance of the uh, planning of the, the uh, uh, Mumbai attacks. We had our attack in seventh uh, of April, 2017, when we had um, uh, Rahmat Akilov, who targeted, uh, who drove a lorry down uh, the bu busiest pedestrian street and uh, that created mayhem. What was interesting about him was that he wasn't from the Middle East, he was Central Asian. And he had planned this for a long time. Uh, for four months, he had contact with six Tajik operational commanders using Cello. Um, as a, so he was in direct contact as he was driving the truck, which killed five, five people. Um, he was also part of a, deni he was a denied asylum seeker. Um, uh, but he had he was in direct contact, particularly with six Tajik operation commanders in Syria uh, at the time. What does the environment look like? I always uh, already talked about this. There are um, this is what it looks like: two thousand jihadists, seven hundred or five to seven hundred right wing and three hundred left wing. We did a study on the Swedish foreign fighters. And this is uh, the results that we had. Um, we, had uh, uh, we had the highest proportion of women of any country in the European Union, uh, 24%. Average was about 19, 18, 19. Um, in Southern Europe, about 10%. Um, average age, 26 years old. Uh, interestingly, 75% were Swedish citizens. 34% were born in Sweden. And then you had 70% were living in segregated areas. And more importantly, 80% were from four cities. This was the travel pattern that you can see. Um, the blue is going down to Syria. And you know, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see this, but you could probably see 13 and 14. Um, the big peak is in August 13. And uh, the, the next largest peak is in October 14. So most of the people who left were uh, going down in, in 13, 14. And you see in 15, almost no one left. And the big problem, I think, in Sweden has been that we didn't have any terrorism legislation that outlawed traveling down to Syria. Um, and you cannot apply this retrospectively. So you know, there is, there is this problem of, of trying to, you know, how do you deal with this issue retrospectively? Uh, here is some of the more famous ones. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, you have Osama Karayem, who is right now in, on trial in Paris for participating in the uh, attacks both in Paris and in Brussels. Uh, on, on the left-hand side, you have a very famous Swedish person who brought many of his kids down, who he comes from the Gothenburg area. Um, but you had, um, uh, you had some serious, I mean, even though we had 300 going down, you know that there were almost uh, 40,000 uh, foreign fighters, etc. Sweden with 300 had two people who participated directly in the Paris and the um, Brussels attacks. These are some of them on the top left-hand corner. You can see some of them. Here are some of the other ones who have been important. And, you know, I, I guess it's the same pattern in the U.S. as well as in, in Europe. You have some prominent individuals who, who, who pop up. These have been some of the trends, um, both in, in Sweden and in, in other countries. Um, I, I guess what's interesting is that you have, you know, you have women Women ha have agency, but you know there's a wide spectrum. You have both those who have been participating in violence and uh, enforcement of morality, but you also have those that have been victims, they haven't been able to leave. Um, um, 
And you, you also see the importance of hotspots. Uh, really interesting, the Germans really, uh, released a report accidentally, which revealed out of 800, I think, 780 uh, FTFs, uh, you, they, they, you know, they came from 162 German cities, but there were 13 cities with more than 10 FTFs. Prisons are a source of radicalization, of course, and lots of people being involved in criminality. I just wanted to focus on, on the last point there, and, and that, that is not just for Germany, but also for others. Um, you know, how do you deal with returning foreign fighters? Um, the, in, 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 the, in the German case, uh, only 25% of the returnees and 22% of the parents were cooperating with authorities. So I guess the whole issue is how do you develop techniques, both in terms of pressure, interrogation, but also in terms of creating trust, uh, et cetera. And different countries do different things in, in, in relation to that. But look at the sort of last point there in Germany. More than 48% of the 300 that had returned at the time uh, returned to, to sort of extremist milieus. I'm not going to go into this report. I know we're out of time almost, but this is a sort of a crime terror nexus report done by one of our colleagues, uh, Amir Rostami, who done fantastic work. Now, I mean, it's not, it's not a great tourism for Sweden. Uh, we have 15,244 individuals who are on the suspect list who are really convicted of this in terms of criminal organizations, gangs, extremism. And from that data set, you can see what was extracted. This is why I said we have a strong evidence base, whether they come from, what's their educational level, or the mental health issues, et cetera. Um, this is an issue that's uh, incredibly important. We have to look at microfinancing. How do they finance themselves? What is the funding structures in relation to the radical Islamist milieu, but also the financing of foreign fighters? Um, uh, we also did a report on Salafism and Salafi jihadism and their influence. Uh, there's a compressed uh, uh, study on this. And Sweden is a long country. If you flip it over, it, it, it's Magnus, 10 million. Magnus, go back yeah. and uh, tell us about the financing and the others. You don't have to hurry. OK. <laughs> um, you know, the fun, you know, the, the fun, I, I have another slide towards the end, so I can, I can go back to that. But we, we followed um, uh, the funding dimension uh, is that, of course, we, the Nordics are a welfare society um, where you have uh, ways so you can make money in terms of, um, of, of different schemes. You can do that. One of the most attractive schemes was VAT fraud. And as you may or may not know, VAT fraud is a massive issue in the European Union. What happens is that they buy in particularly, you know, consumer goods like cell phones, uh, computers, other things that they can offload very quickly. And the VAT in uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, I guess, is about 20, 25%. So they never pay in that money. They transfer that money to Turkey, to other, other countries. Uh, some of the more sophisticated ones did that. But they also applied for loans um, and did committed benefit fraud, et cetera. And you have also the whole dimension of, of remittances, et cetera. Um, we did this big report. It's about 250 pages. We mapped out all the Salafi, Jihadi movements, groups uh, in Sweden uh, on a, almost on an individual basis and, and their influence, both violent and nonviolent. And we found, we, we, we found um, particularly that, you, you know, when you think about this issue, you always think about individuals. And yes, individuals are interesting. Interventions with individuals are interesting. But you also have to think about ecosystems. Because in each individual neighborhood where you have this issue, where you have this problem, you will have an ecosystem. You will have an imam that uh, may be radical, that may be sort of 
creating um, creating uh, you know the mobilization reasons for why you want to go you will have uh, facilitators you will have those that are radicalizing recruiting you will have those that are financing you will have those that are logisticians these are very tight-knit communities normally of course you will have lone actors and and others uh, who may do this but what we see is that in mo many of the cities we have environments that know each other that are um, connected to each other that are involved in different activity um, there are of course divisions between ethnicity so for example we have you know uh, Al Shabaab used to recruit from Stockholm suburbs uh, in the 2006, 2007, 2008 period, um, uh, also from Gothenburg. Uh, but you also have sort of, um, uh, you, you have different milieus and environment. Let me show you some of those very quickly. Do, I, do we have enough time, Anne? Sorry, I was muted. Absolutely. Take your time. I think yeah, everyone so, is so, so when we were mapping out this, we started with sort of the heavy duty terrorism person personnel. These are not the persons. These are, <coughs> should we say, imams that were that were, you know, influential. And we found them all in one picture. It's really interesting. Not all of them, of course, are involved in this. Um, many are not involved in this. The ones in, in, in the circle are have now been classified as a threat to national security by the Swedish Security Service, but there were key leadership figures that were shaping this environment. Uh, and six persons were detained by the Swedish Security Service. Now, in order to understand, before I come back to them, you have to understand, and this for, for US, for the US law enforcement community, for the intelligence community in the United States. Uh, who were covering this issue in relation to Iraq as well as to, um, to Sweden and the Nordics, they will know this, the, the Brandberg and Mosque network. Uh, and they were sort of like a North African network that grew up that were uh, implanted into Sweden by key individuals who were distributing uh, the GIA uh, newsletter, but also were part of the North, North African jihadi network. And some of the key sort of net individuals in the Brandberg and Mosque network was Mohammed Mumo. Now, why would you want to know uh, a Swedish jihadi leader who had been influential uh, in this network? Well, the reason why you want to <laughs> why you want to know him and his picture there, Mohammed Mumo, the current ISIS leader Al Qureshi, was under his command. Mohammed Mumo used to be or became the head of the Islamic State of Iraq uh, uh, leader. He was the number two leader in, of the Islamic State of Iraq in Mosul um, before, you know, in 2006 uh, period. You can see all the things he had been involved with uh, in terms of who he has been training with, the groups he was involved with, he was involved with other uh, organizations. This shows like his network into the sphere. And, and I'm not gonna go through all of them because then we'll run out of time. But you can see that uh, that uh, he, was, he has been a central figure. The person who has probably been the heaviest person uh, in relation to the Swedish uh, Salafi Jihadi environment. Um, he was also, of course, um, uh, he had a he, he had a partner uh, who re just recently died, actually, uh, I believe, of COVID, um, uh, who was also involved in 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 uh, in you know in the network. You can see that Mohammed Belkaid and Osama Krayam uh, actually were connected, or at least Mohammed Belkaid uh, Belkaid was connected to the person who who was the key person who was involved in both the, you know, in terms of connections to the, to the four Swedes who went to the U.S. Boston, but also he was the point person to David Headley in the United States. You also had, uh, and this is just a sort of illustration, you had Al-Shabaab, um, and you had Al-Shabaab recruitment, 
Fouad Changoli has been in Sweden for, 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 for quite a time. Uh, and you have different sets of issues that come up in relation to uh, the extremism sort of domain or environment. Uh, these were the six people that were detained by the Swedish Security Service um, in 2019. Um, the names are all out there, so I'm not disclosing uh, anything, but uh, they were detained as sort of, uh, at least the sort of the top level. Um, the three top uh, individuals were, were uh, identified as, as uh, individuals who had, who were giving this sort of ideological um, tone and dimension, etc. Well, while we were investigating this also, we, we were seeing that there were transnational movements that were at work in Sweden. This is, was the Divare Religion, Lease or Read project, uh, outlawed by the German authorities. Why? You can see why. 140 German FDFs were active in this organization. Uh, what was most interesting was that uh, the Al Quran Foundation in, in the southern city of Malmö was the financial hub for much of the activity. So it, it really sort of goes to show that, that um, some of these elements, some of these um, groups also use nefarious means in order to try to recruit more individuals. What has been very noticeable has been the method of influence in Sweden. We've been trying to, these radical Islamists have been trying to develop a network of, of non-confessional schools. Um, and they were had an ambition to create 85 schools across Sweden. They have been, been prevented from doing that. Um, and this picture really shows the financial dimension. Um, to some extent, I don't, you know, I don't want to sort of overemphasize this, but it's very really difficult in relation to, we, we've found some charities that have gone down to Syria that have been problematic. Um, we also had support from some Gulf states uh, back to Sweden in terms of, of some of the more radical um, Islamist domain. But more importantly, education has been exploited as a platform. Look at the number there. US dollar, 120 million. 50, 550 extremists conducted business worth 120 million through 49 companies, NGOs, and foundations. And they had radical, violent radical Islamists on their board of directors. This was a news agency that, that did that revelation. Now, what do we do about it? And I, I'm, I'm going to be telegraphic now. You have to understand the Swedish system. Um, and in Sweden, you have, you're operating on the national level, on the local level. On the national level, you will see um, that, that there are many agencies that are working on security and safety. There are they're pressurizing some of those environments, uh, working to see if they've committed crimes, financial crimes is often a useful way to put pressure on them. But also, of course, <clears throat> like any country, you're working on security and safety dimension. We have social welfare uh, uh, agencies that are working. We have democracy and resilience um, agencies working as well. Um, and and on the local level, I mean, where the real work comes when it comes to ISIS returnees, et cetera, is of course, um, we've created a center for violent extremism, uh, which is like a motor in the system, which um, provides assistance. But the main work of course comes down to police and social services and local co coordinators. Uh, so there's a system in which we uh, process um, ISIS returnees. Uh, of course, many of the things that they have to deal with when they come back from Syria, I mean, uh, when they come back, of course, they will be interviewed uh, by uh, police, uh, by security service, but particularly by police. Uh, and because Sweden doesn't have a war uh, terrorism legislation that will be able to deal with this issue, uh, unless unless, uh, you know, they, they have committed murder, you can prove, etc., is to prosecute individuals for or investigate individuals for war crimes. So most of the returnees are being, being flown back uh, if, they, if they make it out uh, um, through various means. 
and they are met at the airport and they are then processed by the police, by the migration service, by the social service, by everyone. And then they are, um, then they, the municipalities have the responsibility to work with them. And it's of course the police and the social service uh, that, are, that are working together. Um, and um, of course uh, you have more broad, I mean, this democracy resilience dimension is of course uh, democracy strengthening, creating resilience in society, etc. I have five more slides so that's going to telegraphically just show them uh, in terms of challenge, and then we can open up the Q and A. So, so, so challenges. Uh, I, I guess this this is not just in Sweden, but uh, generally, etc. Uh, is that uh, you know how how do they work particularly and we've done this uh, we, we've done a report we were, we were pretty surprised that there hasn't been more research reports etc about the transnational connections of these Salafi ecosystems and to their home conflicts or to their home environments etc there are very few studies uh, on this so how does that sort of Salafi jihadi milieu influence how are they influenced by um, whatever conflict, whatever country or, or, or um, place they come from? Um, are there hotspots? Why are there hotspots? Um, what's the you know, relationship between socioeconomic dimensions uh, as well as uh, organizational dimensions, etc.? Connection with crime. Can you use that connection with crime, the crime terror nexus, uh, which is a natural nexus because they operate in the same environment. Uh, how do you how do you operate there? Uh, what are the tipping points? You know what makes some individuals go to Syria, not others, or to commit violence. What about risk assessment tools in terms of validity? Uh, uh, and there's a great uh, discussion, uh, both academic but also policy making. Why is in terms in terms of risk assessment tools, um, uh, and then of course uh, exit. Uh, to what extent do they invest in exit strategies? This is the funding uh, dimension, uh, um, uh, and interestingly, we did a study on the FTFs in Sweden in 2015, 2016. We went to many, many different countries in Europe. And we asked, you know, look, we are, we are finding that they are microfinancing. What are you seeing? And they were all talking about uh, the fact that, oh, we don't see so much funding, um, et cetera. And maybe it was because they weren't looking. Um, there are inherent problems in the Swedish system um, in terms of exploitation, but I have to say, I'm pretty impressed by the crime fighting agencies Security service, the the um, you know economic uh, crime agencies, etc., who are working really hard to put to put pressure to eliminate these sort of different gaps. Um, the other problems with the returnees, this was the you know old figure, relatively small numbers. I mean, I have to say, in relation to France or Germany or other countries, small numbers of women and, and children that are, are there. Just want to make this sort of also point the fact that we are seeing also the radicalization of a whole generation of youths or children who have grown up in Syria, but also in refugee camps that could be vulnerable, but also we need to address this uh, whole issue who are not involved in ISIS, who, are, who have been affected by the sort of whole conflict. Um, war crimes is the way to go for Sweden. It will, it's going to take a long time. Uh, it raises the whole issue about digital evidence. Uh, can you use it? What kind of evidence can you use in court, et cetera? But I have to say also that the war crimes unit in the Swedish police are working very hard to try to make as solid a case as they can in relation to this issue. And then it comes to the issue of security threat. Uh, the security service in Sweden often says, look, yes, we should focus in on ISIS returnees, et cetera. It, it, you know, if it comes to women, et cetera, one can question whether it's a security threat, but they're coming back to something. And maybe we should focus in 
on the ecosystems that they are plugging into uh, and how we deal with this issue. So sometimes there is too much focus on the ISIS returnees uh, sort of coming back. Um, almost last slide. Uh, prison probation, you talked about this, you have been working on this. Uh, and um, this was a number, we did a study for Peter Neumann, King's College. Uh, I, I did a study on Sweden and Denmark. Uh, last year, this was the number then, um, uh, not a huge number, but you can see, you know, France, um, uh, other countries, um, how dangerous are they? Are they be, are they able to pull the screening systems, etc.? cetera? Uh, what about exit, exit programs? You know, wh what is the status of exit programs? And then lastly, uh, all the imams uh, I mentioned to you, all the people that are non-citizens of Sweden who have been designated as national security threat, we, we face a big problem in relation to how do you ensure the human rights as well as um, maybe uh, expelling them um, uh, outside the EU. The person on the left-hand side was the Danish uh, big imam um, connected to lots of different um, radical environments in Denmark. Um, and he was expelled, actually, in 2019 to Morocco. Um, and I just mentioned him in relation to the fact that this, this is a big issue one struggles with. Um, how do you, if you identify people who shouldn't be in your country or are not citizens who are security threats, how do you deal with them if they if you can't expel them? Uh, and I think this this is sort of a big issue. And I'm sorry, I, I've, I've overdrawn. How can you say sorry after what a fantastic uh, um, presentation? Can you stop screen share though? I stopped screen share. Okay, thank you, Magnus. Amazing, and uh, I expected this from you because I know that you uh, are crossing so many different areas of uh, PCVE, but wow, that was just so comprehensive and such a great presentation. We have lots of questions in the chat, so maybe we can run to those right away because our time will go out. Um, one of the first one was, um, let me see, from Thomas M. Do you want to ask your question, Thomas? Are you still here? Yeah, howdy. Uh, thank you for the great uh, speech, uh, Dr. Ranstrup. I really appreciate it. Uh, so my question is, I've done some some work regarding the, uh, the NMR. So I was curious how proactive do Nordic states work to de-platform the NMR and other similar groups? Additionally, to that point, uh, what is the NMR's relationship with groups outside of, uh, outside of Russia, outside of the Nordic states? I know you had mentioned the uh, that Russian group, uh, and and you had also mentioned the NMR or the NMR's activity on VK. So I was curious the relationship with groups such as in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Wow. Well, um, uh, first of all, in terms of deplatforming, um, I think that there are there are um, relatively little done. They have two functional websites. They have about eighteen, I think. Uh, I may be wrong in terms of the numbers, but it's something like that. Uh, podcasts, not many people are actually listening to them. Uh, the most interesting one is the sort of the, the, the um, Nordic Frontier, uh, which is the one that is the international one. And it gives you really, I mean, the thing about sort of the Nordic resistance movement is that unlike, I, I mean, I spent my, my entire career looking at sort of violent Islamist groups that hide their thing, but normally with, with the Nordic resistance movement, for the most part, um, they, um, they operate in the open. So they're pretty easy to map out. Um, now, uh, in terms of deplatforming, unless they are transgressing laws in terms of incitement uh, to violence or hatred to other groups, they will be prosecuted for that, but they see that as an honor to be prosecuted. So, I mean, I, this is a big sort of dilemma. Um, we are also looking to sort of, you know, should one outlaw them, like in Finland, the positive examples in Finland, there were signs, it's too early. 
um, but but it needs to sort of be processed. In relation to their sort of um, um, the groups that they um, you know uh, interact with and so on, is it, it's um, uh, it's um, uh, I mean, for example, Der Dritte Weg uh, is an organization in Germany which also has been to um, the Russian imperialist movement training camps uh, recently. Um, uh, but also, of course, the standard um, neo-Nazi groups uh, across, uh, across Europe, but also, um, uh, but also the US. Interestingly, from the US perspective, if you listen, there's sort of a grandiose picture of Simon Lindbergh uh, in relation to, he talks in one of his uh, webcasts or, or podcasts uh, about the fact that um, uh, they were present at, in Charlottesville, but in fact, Charlottesville was modeled on the Nordic resistance movement. Uh, they, 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 they feel that they, they have sort of a historic uh, dimension, historic mission. Um, uh, they, it, in relation to Russia, they, um, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, you know, we haven't sort of dwelled too deeply into exactly who is connected to them on VK, um, but it's very noticeable that that's the platform that they are active in. Um, uh, they uh, also, because of regulations in Sweden, Many banks don't want to deal with them. They have moved to cr uh, cryptocurrency. Um, when we did our study in 20, um, 2019, 2020, uh, they had about, I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a lot of money. They had about $100,000, $150,000 uh, in cryptocurrency. Um, so it's not a sort of a rich movement, but I would sort of they are certainly, given their long-standing connections to Russia, uh, I, I would look towards that sort of connection, given their social media presence. Thank you for that. Um, uh, many people are asking, Magnus, if they can have a copy of your slides. So if you give us a copy, we'll put it up with the um, event, the recording uh, of it. I, I will also give you, uh, I will also give you um, we have executive summaries of some of the reports. That would be great. A link. So you just get a snapshot. Okay, because everyone's saying, uh, please, can we go over this again? Because it was so uh, uh, deep and um, intensive on the uh, information. I'm going to open the floor to TM Garrett because he had a few questions for you. TM was an extremist in Germany way back when. He's now one of the good guys. And uh, he's on our team. We always copy the terrorists and try to do what they do. So we're going international links as well and uh, trying to uh, move against them. But um, Tim, you had a few questions. Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Magnus, first of all, for that great, great presentation with a lot of great, great insight. So my questions, I had some links to, to certain groups in Scandinavia as well in the late 90s and the early 2000s. But that was mostly led um, by the former uh, Wit Aaron uh, Mottstein, the White Aaron Resistance there in Sweden, but also by these Blood and Honor and the Combat 18 groups, where Eric Blucher, uh, Eric Nielsen was very prominent and leading in those efforts. And what I've always seen in this couple of years that I was active was a strong connection between especially Northern German forces in that movement and the Scandinavian forces. And I was just wondering if, if that because it wasn't mentioned at all, if there's still such a strong connection. Well, there are, there are strong connections to individuals who are taking part in many of the different parades in Germany and also of, of, the, German, of the German organizations that have, have been involved. I know, I know Tori is probably more equipped uh, to talk about that early period so, Tori, do you want to say something about uh, well, I was, I was, I was wondering if Marcel Schilf was a main connector, actually, at the time. And we know he died in uh, 2001, I believe. And it might, might have died down because he was German-Danish. So, I don't know if he was a, a big factor or not. Did, well, uh, he may have, may have not been. It's a time period we, didn't really, we haven't really looked at. Um, 
Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the study that we did was primarily looking at the Swedish resistance movement in, and its connections and then how, how it evolved. But we also had um, other uh, researchers who, you know, it was an anthology, it was, it was an edited um, uh, work. Um, but maybe, Tori, do you have any, something to add to that? You, you probably sit on the piece of information because you've been following this throughout the 1990s. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of, uh, of personal as well as organizational uh, uh, connection at the time. People were traveling quite a lot, uh, taking part in, in each other's um, uh, events, demonstrations, parties, uh, so on. And that is still going on. Um, it has been a bit quieter during the last few years due to the pandemic. But uh, we know that the Nordic resistance movement and that network also the Nordic force are well connected internationally in in a number of countries. So so both to the U.S., to Germany, to Britain, and so on. So it's it's a lot of a lot of both personal connections and more uh, more kind of formal or historical connections. But I I would like to add one uh, one thing. Uh, I I sent put in a little ch chat on that. You focus a lot on organizations and milieus, but you didn't say very much about lone actors. Because when it comes to terrorist violence in Sweden and in Norway as well, most of the terrorist violence has been committed by, by lone actors like the Laser Man of Sonius, Peter Mangs, Anton Ludin, and we have had, uh, of course, Breivik and, and, uh, and um, uh, also uh, others in Norway who have been acting alone. So, so uh, that is a particular challenge. They are not necessarily connected very strongly to the... To the organizations uh, but uh, and in a way to some extent be being an organization is a kind of um, they make them more restrained when it comes to terrorist violence because they know that once they carry out terrorist violence they will be cracked down uh, immediately by the by the security services exactly and, they, they, and this is why i mean i don't want to sort of minimize the sort of threat of uh, because because the nordic resistance movement has other ways in terms of how they intimidate people, uh, how they intimidate, go after politicians, how they go after individuals who they see as enemies of the state. And you're a absolutely right. The fact that uh, they are restrained in relation to uh, get particularly because they, you know, they want to participate in an election. They want to uh, also recruit members. They don't want to, uh, you know, without any directives from the, from the top, you don't do any sort of, um, you know, impulsive uh, activity, which makes them also more predictable uh, to some extent. Um, but I think, uh, I think uh, uh, it is the lone actors that are problematic. We've had school kids that are that that have been uh, doing stabbings and school, uh, you know, uh, violence, uh, who have uh, been uh, connected. To, well, who have, who have taken sort of like. A, who have morphed all these sort of different ideological reasons, but in the right wing sphere, um, um, both neo Nazi, but also in, in, in relation to the other, other symbols and conspiracy theories, etc., and carried out attacks. So it is a very real issue. It, it's the most difficult issue for the security services to, 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 to deal with. You're all depressed now. Please come to Sweden. Just add to that, we had this paradox uh, we, in Norway with, with this terrorist, uh, Philip Manshaus, who in uh, 1919 was inspired by, by, by the, the, the New Zealand terrorist. Uh, he had applied to become a member of Nordic resistance movement during the summer in June, July um, uh, 2019. Uh, and he was interviewed and then he heard, didn't hear anything more. And the reason was that at the time the Nordic resistance movement was splitting up and those interviewing him went to the Nordic force and they kind of forgot him. And then he got his hand with, with the manifesto of, of um, Breton Tarrant and he was so inspired that he decided to carry out his terrorist attack in uh, against a mosque and also killing his adopted sister from China. Uh, the paradox is that if he had been accepted into the Nordic resistance movement, it's quite 
very probably, very likely that he would not have he committed the ter- act of terrorism. He would probably have been uh, kept um, in check by the organization because yeah. they were not interested in that kind of attack. So, so it's it's a paradox. So sometimes these organized groups keep the most uh, wild um, elements uh, at bay by by because of their discipline them. Uh, you're absolutely right, and we 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 mentioned that in a, in the study that we uh, we did, and and uh, it's a good example of of uh, of the um, this whole dimension that you mentioned. Uh, we we also, of course, uh, COVID has had an impact, and they were and Amar was really excited about COVID because that will lead to mass unemployment. The conditions will be ripe to recruit you know uh, disaffected people um they they are also you know into ecological dimensions living in with the forest and close to nature um, um having local sort of uh, local um presence uh, is is very important for them what is so amazing is that they 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 really have failed miserably and that the fact that they they didn't do better in the election and that that was part of one of the strategy that they had they kept all other options open of course all the time um uh, base activism all the things that were standard for for them in terms of intimidation in terms of of showing that they are a force to be reckoned with etc they did so poorly i mean they have real have had real problems in terms of uh, growing um uh, you, you're not seeing people flocking to them, uh, but it doesn't mean that, that there isn't a problem. And th- this is the point I wanted to make: is that just to look at the NMR, yes, they are there. They are a problem. They create problems. They are um, very serious um, uh, in relation to the threat level. Um, but you have a wa- broadening, a widening of the spectrum by those that that are operating in the so-called alt-right sphere. Um, so, um, you know, you have this sort of loosening of boundaries where you have you have a convergence of the same kind of messaging. Um, you have interaction between alt-right figures. Sweden has a disproportionate amount of alt-right figures internationally. Some of the most prominent ones in the U- based in the United States or Canada. And they, um, uh, they of course, uh, are interacting uh, carefully. Uh, it's not a, always a happy relationship, um, um, but they are they are interacting through the podcast. But you can really see their um, the contact points in the United States, but also internationally through what's published on their websites, but also who is participating in these pod conversations. Uh, I think the... Yeah, um, we see that too. We see that in our research. Oh, we're going to have to finish, but um, I'm going to give you one more question and just uh, tell a question that was in the direct messages, um, which I don't think you'll have time to answer both of them. But in the direct messages, they were asking about um, uh, how the Salafis are recruiting and who is standing against that. And I'll just answer that by saying four weeks from now, and I hope you'll come back, Magnus, we are going to have one of these Salafi preachers that was standing against ISIS. And uh, and he can speak about the ecosystem uh, that was horrible uh, for him to be watching kids recruited from Sweden to go to Syria and how they were trying to stop it and where they succeeded and where they couldn't succeed because... Um, you know, sometimes the system, like you said, Magnus, is really strong, and uh, and not not a government system, an illicit uh, uh, terrorist system. But the question that um, I thought would be good for you to end on is from uh, Helen. Uh, hello, Helen. I'm glad you're here. Uh, she was asking about to these groups, the two that you talked about, the Nordic Resistance Movement and the um, militant jihadists, the people that would have gone to uh, Syria or came back. Uh, what kind of reciprocal radicalization is going on between them, and do they actually fight each other? And uh, and then you can also give your closing remarks, and then we will have to stop. But wow, you've been amazing, and thank you. I think everyone. Well, well, 
No, thank, thank you, Anne. Um, do reciprocal, uh, of course, uh, the atmospherics uh, create reciprocal radicalization. I, I, I would say today, the the most immediate terror threat, etc., is of course to by by um, lone actors within the uh, and this is not me talking. It's it's the security service is uh, from the um, uh, the radical Islamist environment, um, particularly lone actor. We should we should they you know it's still there. Um, at the same time, you also have right wing. Um, um, lone actors uh, motivated by radical nationalist uh, ideology that are targeting Jewish institutions as well as mosques. So I, I would say the kind of attack that we saw Philip Manhaus do in, in um, Norway is probably uh, something that uh, is very real uh, in relation to, uh, to threat levels. So um, yes, I mean, you know, polarization, the difficulty is encountering all of these different, you know, if, if we say to counter to counter the radical Islamist milieus, etc., the difficulty is that we have segregated areas. And unless you tackle also the segregated areas and to try to push back, so we have pushback in terms of crime prevention, in terms of putting pressure on these milieus by the law enforcement agencies, et cetera. But because they're embedded within uh, socially segregated areas, where you have other problems like gang criminality, where you have other social, uh, socioeconomic issues, then, then you, it complicates the response. And you, you really have to have political will, but also uh, a strategy locally to be able to work to not only work individually, you know, I guess the problem is when we work on these issues, when we talk about these issues, we talk about them as they are disconnected. We only talk about individuals. And if you only talk about individuals, you know, there are a lot of idiosyncratic reasons for why someone may join or what pushes them over the edge, et cetera. But if you don't see them, how they may, I mean, sometimes they're completely alone, so you have to see them as individuals. But if you don't see them in a system, if you don't have the data in relation to what does the ecosystem mean? Who is the movers and shakers in relation to, to, to uh, these sort of different environments? Then it's really difficult to be able to, to make any headway. And I think across Europe, we are also have to think about the whole, it's not just about this, the Salafi jihadi environment, but we also have to think about, um, you know, the um, wh whether that's a tip of an iceberg in relation to other problems, not maybe violence, but also in relation to um, democratic rights and, and, and freedoms. Um, uh, this is something huge in uh, in France, in Austria, in Germany, in, in the Netherlands, etc., you, you know, there, there is a sort of a connection between the Salafi jihadism community, but also a broader spectrum in terms of a challenge to democracy, in terms of uh, uh, women's uh, women equality, uh, individual rights and freedoms, etc. And that's a delicate, that's a minefield of issues that comes into integration, that comes into, in, in, into the very essence of, of uh, ensuring some of the values that we are here to protect. How do you do that? Um, <laughs> difficult. And there are those that, that want to undermine the work that CVE, PVE individuals are trying to do. So we have to, we have to really understand the space. We have to map out the space, not only of the bad guys, but also what is the space? What are other issues in relation to this issue? And that we haven't done very well. That's maybe a good place to stop. And uh, thank you for your amazing work over all these years and uh, for your reports. I'll wait for the links from you and we'll put that in with the chat log and we'll put it on the uh, event log. And, uh, and your report, we would love to have a copy of that. Oh, your slides. If you would uh, send us your slides, we'll put that on the web as well. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, everyone, no, thank, you. thank you in the comments and uh, we'll end there. And when you come to Washington, you sh be sure to let me know because I'd like to take you out to dinner. And the same to Sweden. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for attending.